We should all be millionaires. That's a pretty bold statement, right? Well, today's guest will be teaching us how we can say hello to seven. Seven figures, that is. Let's stop talking about six figures. Let's just start talking about seven and start moving towards seven and normalize that. Normalize becoming a millionaire and that being the goal instead of six figures. Now, before we hop into today's show, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Now, let's jump into the video. Rachel, so you have built such a phenomenal business around helping black sisters, actually all people, right? Yes. Not just black all, sisters. All people except straight white guys. We don't help them. That's, that's, <laughs> that's how we're gonna start the show, right? <laughs> to be clear, wow. but, the whole world is created for the straight white men. And so my business is not gonna be dedicated to their growth and potential. My <sighs> business is dedicated to everybody else's growth and potential. Okay, all right, dedicated. But, yes. but if a straight white man says, hey, I wanna learn from you. I'll be like, um, let me see, do we have aligned values? Because if I'm gonna let you in my community, right. you need to understand that we do not center white maleness in this community. So if you are good with that, then you can be in this space. But understand that everywhere we go in the world, the world revolves around white men, and we do not do that at Hello 7. Hello 7. <laughs> Hello 7. Correct, yes. Hello 7. Hello 7 is the name of the business. Yes. Where does 7 come from? Seven figures. Seven figures. Hello yes. 7 figures. So and you, you, you know why I named it that? Because this was, you know six years ago when I started this company, but I started entrepreneurship 12 years ago. Okay. So when I started, everybody was like, get to six figures, if you yeah. could just hit $100,000. Yeah. And I did that, and yeah. I did multiple of that, and I was like, well, why am I still, you know, borrowing from Peter to pay Paul? Right. <laughs> While I'm st why am I still struggling to make payroll, right? Like, I'm making multiple six figures, half a million, maybe more, and it's still, you know, there's a lot of management because I'm running a law practice. I got lawyers to pay on yeah. my payroll. I have right. assistants. I have software. We have an office space, right? Like so much, like we talk about the top line revenue, but not the expense. And like, let's talk about the profit margin. So to me, six figures. And even if you just think about running a, you know, living in DC, in LA, in New York, there's all kinds of studies and research that show that $100,000 is not enough, especially if you have children and a family. And so to me, I was like, let's stop talking about six figures. Let's just start talking about seven and start moving towards seven and normalize that. Normalize becoming a millionaire and that being the goal instead of six figures. Yeah, I like that. I like that analogy. I, 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 don't, I don't really like it when people say six figures is not enough, but I do understand. If you're making six figures and you're living in, in the heart of L.A., or in the heart of D.C. or in the heart of New York. I get that. And that's where a lot of the work is, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. now the world is changing post-COVID. Exactly. But that's not, but still a lot of people live in cities where there's a lot of work, right? Yeah. And then where there's a lot of work, there the housing prices go up. Yep, yep. And you know, I mean, I used to pay, my mortgage was $2,700 a month living outside of New York. Right. And then childcare was another like twenty five hundred dollars because I had two, two babies. Ooh. I had I had two that are nineteen months apart. So, so they you both already at five grand by itself. Gone. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Out the gate. Right. That's before I buy food, right. electricity, right? right? And right. don't want to enjoy yourself ever. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like yeah. so just just living was expensive. You know, it was very expensive. And that so, you know. I just, and my husband, before I had my business, my husband used to make six figures in his company. Okay. And and I think we were more comfortable then. He owned his house. It was a little bit less expensive. Um, he has one child, so it was my stepdaughter. So it was like we had, when it was just the three of us, I think it was a little bit more comfortable, but still tight sometimes. Nice. Um, but honestly, even now that I think about that, that's not true because he had a side hustle. He used to make money on the side from real estate. So, Yeah. So, <laughs> Even back then, and this is, you know, 12, 13 years ago when I was, before I graduated from law school. So you have a law degree? Yes. Where'd you go to school? I went to Cardozo in New York. Take out any student loans? I took out all the student loans. All the student loans. <laughs> all of them, between undergrad and, and grad school, which at the time, right, it was very stressful and scary. Like, I, I kind of just took out the loans and didn't think about it. But then at the end of law school, like right before you graduate, they sit you down in a room mm -hmm. and then everybody gets a printout of all of their loans and it's a horrifying experience. <laughs> 
it's like, wait, what's that number? That's like the biggest number I ever saw, right? Because at the time, serious? the most money I had ever made at that time was what, $36,000 a year? Wow. And then I'm looking at a loan sheet that was like, I think I was at 300 grand between right, right. undergrad and law school at that Ooh. point. Ooh. Did you ever use a degree? Well, actually, you did. You yeah, I ran, a, I, ran, I ran a law practice for seven years. If you had to go back, would you do it again? Would you pay 300000 100%. You would take out $300,000 again. I, do you know how much money I make now? My but, net worth is... are you is, in law, though, right now, though? No, but even in law, I made a lot of money, right? Even in law, I made almost a million dollars a year in that practice. And I think it was... And I was doing something I did. I had to muscle my way to that because it was not something I wanted to be doing. Okay. Well, you didn't want to do law? I, I thought I did. Like, that when I was eight years old, I used to watch my mom watch movies, you know, with, like, the, the lawyer in the room, like, yeah, yeah. standing up for the little guy. And I was yeah. like, yes, that's me. I want to be that guy, right? Yeah, I got you. That's why I went to law school. And I, I feel like what I got in law school was not necessarily... First of all, it was traumatizing. Let's be clear. Let's be real. <laughs> it was a traumatizing... And I'm a very good student. Okay. But it was very... It was just... It was mostly a white male space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was the token, yeah. and they and I knew I was the token because they would always put me on a brochure. I remember walking down the hallway one day after my professor, who I was on a project with another guy, who <laughs> he didn't do any of the work. I did all of the work, and then afterwards, I got yelled at from the professor for not doing enough. Like we should have done more, even though I won the case. So this was in our legal clinic. So I was, I remember walking down the hallway flaming mad at this guy that mm. just yelled at me, the professor. And then I see like a picture of me mm -hmm. in the hallway. And I'm just, I wanted to throw something at that picture. Because it was just like, you know, they want to sort of trot me out as yeah. the poster child because they need yeah. more people of color. So anyway, it was, it was a traumatizing experience. However, what I did learn that was incredibly valuable was I learned writing skills. Okay. I learned how to speak publicly. Yeah. Like, and I think those two things alone have made me tens of millions of dollars at this point. So I think I honed those skills. Like they would do, when you write a legal brief, there's a word count. Okay. You have to convince the judge you have a set of facts that you cannot change, right? right, right. And you have a, law, a set of laws that you cannot change and you have to make those facts work with those laws and convince the judge of your version of events. Right. And you have a very tight word count to do it. This is right. not an easy thing to do. So you'd write it out and then they taught us, like once you write it out, you go line by line and cross out every superfluous word. Right, so it's just like you learn how to communicate so concisely. Yeah. Um, and it makes your write, your writing and your um, speaking so much more powerful, yeah. right? Yeah. And so like those two things were, wow. I've got a huge return on investment just from those two things. And I mean, you know, it, it obviously taught me some resiliency. There were definitely networking and connections that happened during law school that were valuable to me. So I have no regrets about doing it. That's good. But it was, yes, it was a, it was an expensive endeavor. But I also, I'm a big dreamer. I dream big and then I go, I, I take big action as well to make those dreams happen. Yeah. So there was never any doubt in my mind that I was going to cover those costs. I just right. was curious how long it was going to take. <laughs> so how, how long did it take you? Um, what did it take? I mean, it took me some time because I didn't, and I mean, this is something that I think you would disagree with me on, but this is the real it is, talk. It is, yeah. The real talk is I put my loans in deferment mm -hmm. and I focused on building my business. Okay. And I don't regret that choice either. Okay. So like, you know, the interest, you know, the interest did pile up over time and it, you know, the, the number got bigger, but it was already huge anyway. So to me, it was like, how much I could chip away at it or I could use that money to build this asset. And so I chose to do that. Okay. And then, you know, within five or six years, I was making enough money to tackle cut, those loans. Just cut one check for them. Yeah, be done. She a baller. Yo, real quick, you guys, are you looking to change your career here in the year of 2023? If so, look no further than Bethel School of Technology, the only Christian online tech boot camp in the world. According to a recent report, black people make up just about 4% of the US technology workforce. But you see at Bethel Tech, who I partner with for this year, they believe that all people, including us black people, should have access to the lucrative and fulfilling opportunities in the tech industry. Now, with their nine 
month program, you'll gain the essential skills you need to start a successful career in technology. And let's not forget the earning potential. You see, according to Indeed, the average salary of a software developer in the US is around $103,000. Say what? You know, you can choose from programs like the cybersecurity and UI UX design and launch your tech career or even a tech business ignited with passion and purpose. So listen, we're gonna skip the debt and we're gonna invest into yourself for just nine months that can change the next nine years of your life. All you gotta do is join Bethel Tech today to achieve your career aspirations. Visit anthonyoneal.com slash Bethel or click the link in today's show notes today so you can register and start a new journey of your life. Now, you know what? Let's get back to the show because this is a good one today. Let's keep it about. This is a black baller, right? <laughs> totally disagree with the concept. But, hey, <laughs> but you, uh, she, I don't, just, she don't have them today, though. So exactly, I mean, that's, that's the thing that matters. And I think the thing is, to me, it's like it's all about commitment. Whatever the strategy you choose, commit to it. Go all in right. until you get to the result that you want. No, I can rock with that. Give me some love right there, right? <laughs> it's all about a strategy. You know yes. what I'm saying? And and I think whatever strategy you choose, whether that's my strategy, your strategy, that strategy, this strategy. I think it's two things. Make sure it's the right strategy for you mm -hmm. and the, the best return for you in your future. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? And you've built, uh, I mean, what, within the last two years, just on um, one particular stream, you, you've done about $30 million. Mm -hmm. And so I think your strategy is going to look different from someone who makes $50,000 a year. For sure. And remember, when I started, my first job was making $41,000 a year. Come on now. Where, so, where'd your first job? You remember? My first job was clerking for a judge. So yeah. right out of law school, I got a clerkship with a judge. Okay. State judge in New Jersey. Yeah. Loved him, learned so much from him. Yeah. And it's like, immediately, you're the boss, right? So I'm telling lawyers what to do because yeah. I'm representing the judge. Yeah. So it taught me leadership, and he taught me a lot. And I was making barely any money. Yeah. So at this point, I actually moved out of my house that I owned, moved into this part, your love. I moved into. <laughs> why, 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 why I feel like where this is going right now. <laughs> well, you're not going to like this. Oh, but you'll love this. But you ain't going to like this, but you're going to love this. Like, what in the world, Rachel? <laughs> Just, just enjoy the show. <laughs> <laughs> but we moved from my home to a basement apartment. Okay. While I was clerking for the judge, because our in, like my husband was making a hundred thousand dollars a year. Right. I wasn't working because I was in law school. This was be right before we got we got married. Right before my third year of law school. Okay. Okay. So he was the breadwinner, and I was going to school. Love it. Um, and then you know. We we graduated. He wanted to leave his job. It was absolutely making him miserable. And I was like, do it. Like, we can live a little tighter for a while. Mm. And trust me, this is going to be great. Yeah. And this is, you know, this is where my saleswoman comes in. Because awesome. I'm always, like, te telling my husband, it's going to be great. Yeah. We're going to cake. Like, yeah. just give me some time, right? And he's like, all right, I'm with it. So he's encouraging me. He's helping me. He's in school now. Okay. While I'm, I'm, you know, working and doing this job. And we lived in this basement apartment. We got a tenant for our house to cover the mortgage. We turned in our, what did we have, like an Acura Infinity. We had an Infinity FX35. I loved that car. That was my first new car that I ever bought. Love it. And so, <laughs> turned that in, was driving the Nissan Altima with 100,000 miles on it, mm. you know, which was, my husband is a car dude. Right now, this man has a lot of cars, and I don't even know how many. Like, <laughs> well, no, I think he has like four cars and five motorcycles I don't know wow. I've lost track but anyway he's a car dude when I met him he was driving a Range Rover okay. then he went down to the infin the Infinity FX 35 then he's now he's in a Nissan Altima. he's like ever since I met you my car's getting whacker what, what? <laughs> we going the wrong way right. <laughs> so I'm like funny. no no but we gonna go back we gonna right. go back. it's it's a curve it's a bell okay. curve <laughs> that's so funny what is he driving now? What's his favorite car now? He now he's driving a Porsche something or other I know it was expensive I don't know what kind of Porsche it is, Yo, but it's uh, one of those two-seater things, and it's like the hot one. He's gonna be mad at me that I didn't know which one it was. <laughs> no, I love it. I love we it. have that and a Mercedes AMG, like the seven-seater, because we got mad kids. So. Mad kids. How many kids? We have four. Four. So you go from school, three hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt, uh, working for a clerk, forty-one thousand, downgrade to a uh, apartment. Mm -hmm. Your husband downgrades cars like crazy to now to where just last year you all did eight figures mm -hmm. um, in income 
Uh, the year before that, you did eight figures. This year, you're on track to, to possibly do uh, far north of 20 million. The title of your book, which is the reason why I wanted to come on the show, is because and when I hear when I when I hear this title, I fringe a little bit. So I had to do a little bit of research on it because I'm like, uh. But the title of your book was "We Should All Be Millionaires." Yes. And when I hear this come from certain people, I, I fringe because I'm like, wait, are you even one? Mm-hmm. one? Well, yes. You know what I'm saying? I know you are. <laughs> I know you are. I'm saying, but when I hear Yeah, come correct, that, right? You know what I'm saying? Yes, that's right. One, are you one? Two, what's your philosophy on becoming a millionaire? Because I think oftentimes, I'm just going to be real, in the black community, we look for the shortcut. Mm-hmm. And we're not willing to honestly put in the work yes. uh, to build a credible character, strong integrity business that brings value to people. And so I cringe a little bit because it's, it's easy to make a million but also at the same time, I've seen people make a million and then screw their people over. But but you're not doing that. Mm-mm. And I was like, okay, let's get her on the show. That's a very bold statement. Um, and I truly do believe this. Mm-hmm. I remember when we made our first million, I was like, wow, this is... This wasn't easy, but it wasn't hard neither. Exactly. Like, this is not nowhere near as impossible as people think it is. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? I was like, well, wait. Let's go for another one. Yes. Like, well, dang, that, that wasn't hard. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, where? Where did that philosophy come from that we all should be millionaires? Yes. Well, I had to fight my publisher for the title because okay. <laughs> they wanted me to say, like, millionaire mindset or something. And I'm like, have no. you met me? It yeah, needs yeah. to be bold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I want it to be, I want that reaction. Yeah. I want it to be almost polarizing, right? So it grabs attention mm-hmm. because to me, this was, you know, this is a manifesto. Yeah. It's saying, like, we need to pay attention to our money and make different moves. And when we make those different moves, we're going to have big results, right? And so here's the other thing, too, is, like, I totally believe in marching in the streets. I fund some of my friends who march in the streets. Mm-hmm. And I feel that funding is required, right, for Absolutely. all of the causes we care about, for all of the things we want to change in the black community, right, yes. for us. Um, and so to me, it's like it takes money to make everything that we want to happen happen. Yeah. And we need to get that money. Yeah. It is yeah. accessible to us. It's far more accessible than we realize. We just choose to accept that we're making less, mm-hmm. right? So like you were saying, you know, doing it with integrity, taking action, right? Mm-hmm. Really committing, doing all of that. And I still want the shortcut. Like I still want it the fastest way possible. I got you. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And so, and I've made money the long way mm-hmm. and the take long way, the mm-hmm. exhausting way, right? Yeah. I've made money a lot of different ways and I've also tried it different ways. I've had so many different businesses business models over the years. And I've also coached thousands of clients who have had lots of different business models. And I have formulated a pathway that is like the take you from zero to three million. Mm -hmm. What is the fastest step? And it's like seven levels, right? And at this level, you do these things. And at this level, you do these things. And this is what I teach in the club. This is what my second book is going to be about is teaching this path because the first book is about we can do this. We just need to pay more attention. We need boundaries. We need people not wasting our time. We need to have a support system, right? Mm-hmm. Like, what are the conditions that we need to all become millionaires? That's good. Let's create that in our lives. That's what this book is about. And let's start taking some action towards it, right? And then, you know, the next book is going to teach all of the how. But there's some how in the first book as well. I mean, the how is important. Yes. And I think that my problem with shortcuts is if it's only a shortcut. Yes. But I believe that there's, I wouldn't even call your way a shortcut. I would call it, it's a strategic route. Yes, exactly. To me, you know how people will be like, well, what's the way to do this? Okay, well, I have to do all these things. What I do is I start with, what do I want? Yeah, yeah. I want to solve these problems. I want to send my kid to all the extracurriculars that I want to send them to, right? I want to be able to drive this kind of car. I want to live in this neighborhood. I want to have a backyard, Mm -hmm. right, for my kids to play in. Yeah. Um, you know, I want to pay for my mother's rent. I want, like, I have a list of things that I want for myself, for my community, saving-wise, investing-wise. They were all in this list. I literally had an iPhone note of all of the things that I wanted to be able to do. Mm-hmm. And I just added it up. How much monthly income do I need to be able to do all of these things? At the time, it was like $300,000 a year was the salary that I needed to be able to do all the things I wanted to do. And at the time I was probably making like a hundred from mm. my business, mm. what I was netting after paying everybody, mm-hmm. right? 
Um, and so I'm like, okay, great. These are the things that I want. What is my fastest path? What? Okay, now that I know what I want, let me assess what I have. I have these skills. I have these talents. I have access to this audience. I have this network, right? Like whatever it is that I have, I have these people on my team. How can I take these ingredients? It's like, you know, you go into the kitchen. So this is what we got. <laughs> right? And how do we work? What we going to, how we yeah, going to make yeah. a feast out of whatever we got in the kitchen, That's right? So and so good. I see it the same way. It's like what skills do we have that can make us a millionaire as quickly as humanly possible, preferably Ooh. in the next 12 months. And you have such a huge passion for ladies, which I feel a certain kind of way about that cuz the subtitle of your book was A Woman's Guide to Earning More, Building Wealth and Gaining Economic Power. Yes. Um where does the passion come from ladies and their skill set? Why? Why are well, you leaving us brothers out this picture? <laughs> well, a lot of brothers read the book and they all they were like, this book is for brothers too, right? They literally DM me and say that. I'm like, I'm so glad. And we have a lot of brothers that are in the club, okay, right? That are okay. part of the part of our community as well. Love but it. the reason why I focused on women is because I feel like we tend to undervalue ourselves. Mm. You know what I mean? Like Ooh. when I see men building businesses, they're like immediately hiring help, immediately delegating, immediately doing like they're they're in conquer mode, right? Yes. Why? Because you are socialized to be a conqueror yes. as a man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Women are socialized to support you in that, That's right? True. That's true. But you're not my husband. Why am I supporting you in that, right? And it's like, okay, listen, you can support. I literally have written blog posts about this. Like, stop supporting your man's dreams before you support your own. Ooh. Okay? We need to have our own money. I have watched family members, good friends, Ooh. spend a lot of time and energy building somebody else's business, and then they go for the whatever, whoever they decide is cuter, right? And forget about this woman who done built this whole empire with them. And what does she have to show for it? Absolutely nothing. Hell no. No. So wait, wait. <laughs> you talking about like someone like who they're dating, or you talking about your husband? Too? I'm sorry, I'm just talking about somebody I'm dating. Oh, I was about to say. If it's my husband, oh. obviously we've made a commitment. That's different. Oh, I'm thankful for clearing that up. <laughs> I was about to be like, damn, you're going to put your stuff before your husband? It shouldn't no. be It shouldn't be his before hers, hers no. before when, his. When, it's, when it we're married, it's ours. Yeah. Right? And it's, we talking and, good and, now? And, and I, you know, obviously there's different types of marriages, so make sure you got somebody who's committed. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Um, but when y'all are committed, then you're building together. I like how you said that, though, because I, I agree with you on that part. Yes. You know what I'm saying? A woman should not be putting her boyfriend's mm -hmm. dream before hers. Absolutely not. And it's like, I can support you in your dream, but I am not taking it on and making it my own. No. Okay. And I believe that a man, a man, I'm not supporting my girlfriend's dream more than mine. Exactly. And it's called, like, to me, it's million dollar boundaries, right? And there's a mm, whole chapter in the book about right that. There. I like that. Because we need to have, the reason why we don't have as much money is because we don't have boundaries. We, we let our friends keep us on the phone all night, complain about the same stuff that they ain't going to do nothing about anyway. Okay, well, get off this phone because I have things to do. I'm trying to build something here. I can't sit on the phone with you and hear about Boo Boo and what he did this time <laughs> again, right? When you ain't leaving that man or the job that you hate that you're never going to quit. I'm not listening to to that for three hours get off my phone and let me go build this business right and it's not just that it's also like volunteering for the PTA for how many hours a week right uh, doing your mother and your cousin and your auntie's taxes it's like all these different ways in which people steal our time especially as women especially as black women right it's black women doing all the cooking doing all the decorating <laughs> doing all the things and I'm like I have money to make I don't have time to take care let me take care of me first then I can take care of everybody else so and that has worked for me because now I can take care of so many members of my family without taxing myself without it hurting me so you just proved my point. <laughs> you, you just, she just, you just literally summed up why I will not spend more than a hundred dollars on a date. Yes, I've heard you say that. Because it's a million dollar boundary. Well, here's the thing, though. Uh huh. <laughs> I'm not. I do not have time. Yes. You know, I'm looking at your assistant right now. <laughs> I do not have time to sit here and to fund your dreams, to fund your lifestyle when I'm trying to set boundaries around my life, my peace, and be able to provide all the dreams and lifestyle that my wife has. Why am I doing that for a woman? Million dollar boundary. Well, that woman. Sha -ba 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 <laughs> that woman might be your wife, though. Absolutely. I totally agree. But on the first date, I don't know that. You do not know that. And I agree. I don't think you need to spend. I've never been. I have never been the the, the woman who is like cares about that kind of thing. So your husband didn't take you on a, an expensive first date? Where's your first date? Um, our first date, we went to the movies. Mm -hmm. When we we stopped at Starbucks, got a coffee, went to the movies. No, you didn't. You were, yes, you were, you were you were a coffee lady. Oh, I'm hardcore. Uh, but we went. We stopped by Starbucks, 
And then we went to the movies, and then we went to a diner and barely ate our food, but we really just wanted to keep hanging out. You know what I mean? So it was not an expensive date. And honestly, I don't think many of our dates were expensive. It was like, you, probably the most expensive date we went on was like going to Great Adventures. When it was like the week, of, the week of his birthday. You know, it was summertime, that kind of thing. What? But like, But like, we didn't really go on expensive. We wanted to hang out and spend time together. It really wasn't uh, about that. It's an, I'm never, I've never been interested in that. Now, though. I mean, it's a different subject, though. Yes, now I'm like, listen. You're making don't, almost a million dollars a month. So, but, you know what I'm saying? It's like. <laughs> It's like, you know, like, I mean, I have different standards. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? And I think that there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Because who I am today, you know, we're, we're blessed. You know what I'm saying? Very blessed as well. And it's like, what the things that I like today, the things that I buy today, the things that I can do today, I couldn't do that 10 years ago. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I think everything comes with evolvement. And I think that's how relationships are. Everything needs to come with steps. I think a woman yes. should not come to the table on the first date and have expectations on the very first date with the man. Of like fancy dinners and period. That kind of I don't. Thing. I don't think she's come to the day with any expectations other than treat me like the queen that I am. And if you're not going to respect me and honor me, don't even don't even waste my time. Right. But some women might have the definition of like, especially if she's going to nice places. Because the older you get, right, and you might. What be, I got to do with me? The, no, but you. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying you. The older your dating pool might be getting, or yeah, I yeah. don't know. Maybe you do date 20 year olds. I'm not sure, but. <laughs> That's illegal. Winnie, <laughs> she can't even drink. <laughs> so, but, you know, as as the dating pool that you are dating mm -hmm. ages as well, yeah. right, these are going to be women who have built things for themselves, who have their own careers, who have right. certain standards. So, like, if I was single and making this kind of money, I have friends who are way younger than me that are making really good money, too. Yeah. And so, like, they take themselves out to nice places where one person eating is $100, right? So, if the guy can't take her out to that $100 dinner, he shouldn't date her at all? I, I, can, I can support you in the principle, but I would say don't be dogmatic about the $100. If it winds up being two, it's okay, right? Like, it ain't gonna hurt nobody. You don't want to do that and wind up missing out on your person because you were so committed to this rule. Is that what you disagreed with me on, on the relationship stuff? No. What was the relationship between you, you disagree on? <laughs> well, you were saying, like, I want a woman who reads the Bible yeah. and is beautiful right. and has a big booty, right? Yeah. Like, you have your criteria, right? Yeah, yeah. What's wrong with that? <laughs> I think you should focus on feelings and not that. I think you should focus on how do you feel when you are in the presence of this person. That is going to last you a long time. Because my 15-year anniversary is coming up, right? Yeah. I've been with my husband for 18 years. Yeah. And there's gonna be periods where nobody's cute, okay? Totally. <laughs> right? Like, totally. there's gonna be not cute periods. Totally. There's going to be periods where, you know, I loved Michelle Obama talking about this, how yeah. she hated Barack for yeah. 10 years. Well, she didn't say she hated him. She heard that words was she didn't like him. She didn't like him, right? Yeah. Exactly. But which also works, him. which also works, right? <laughs> and there's gonna be times when you are married, absolutely. you are absolutely not going to like your partner. Sometimes absolutely. weeks, maybe months. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not years. That's good. You know what I mean? That's, that's what's real. And that's real. and the thing that's going to keep you together is that feeling and that friendship. To me, that is the top priority. That's the stuff that keeps you together long term. Absolutely. Far more than the, you know, some of the frivolous things. Totally agree. But I bet you if your husband was here, he looks at you and thinks that you're still fine. He, I, I know he does. Exactly. And I just, I, I tell him all the time, I'm like, I just happen to get lucky with a fine man because that was not my focus at all. But you're a woman. That's totally different. <laughs> Every man in the world wants to be able to look at his wife. And, and I think it's important because I think that's why a lot of men end up cheating is because the world says, like my parents say, hey, don't worry about the beauty. Mm -hmm. Worry about her feelings. Worry about, can she pray? Can she get on her knees and just shaba? You know what I'm saying? I'm like, Mom, the praying ain't going to work when we get in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm well, saying? Well, attraction... The ain't going to work But neither. the thing is, is like, here's... here's This is a whole nother conversation. But, yeah. I, but I think I standards wondering. of beauty, sometimes we have to ask ourselves, who taught us what looks good? Right? I mean... Because I do think that there is a role... I think there is a role that white supremacy plays in our no. standards in America. No, no, no. What do you mean, no? no what do no. you mean, no? I, <laughs> no. You're saying that white people taught me taught me how to look at a black sister. I've gone on the record. I don't know if you heard me say this. I've gone on record and saying I would never date a white woman. Love you. I would never <laughs> date a white woman. Yes, I understand I, that. I, I watched two black ladies 
I have two I have two mothers, a biological mother and a state mo- stepmother. Yes. Raised me strong. And so a white person didn't teach me how to love a black person. I'm going to be honest with you. I My feel two you. black mothers taught me how to love a black woman. And who let me tell you who taught me how to look at a black woman? My fathers, because mm-hmm. every time my mom was walking in, we could be sitting there. My dad be like, "God, damn, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone." You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so for me, I saw my fathers, yes, loving the way that their spouses looked. I love that. And so for me, I totally agree. We don't disagree on that. I think as a man, no, I just put a little bit more emphasis on because, you know, I'm spiritual. As a Christian, Adam woke up and said, "Wow, wow." Like, he pretty much said Eve was beautiful. Yes. He didn't really worry about the feelings. But now, once I find you beautiful, oh, I, I, the feelings have to be there. Yes. So I'm not saying the feelings are low, because you're absolutely right. And if I made y'all feel, because Rachel's coming, she's coming here to kind of check me a little bit <laughs> at the table. We keep it real relevant and relatable. So let's do it. Thank you, Rachel. But if I made ladies feel like Anthony doesn't value feelings, he doesn't value the deeper connection, that's not the case. I'm just saying for me to even get to the point where I want to know how I feel around you, there needs to be some level of physical attraction because men are physical creatures, ladies are emotional creatures, but not always only emotional Uh, because men have emotions, but we tend to lead with that that physical. So once Mm -hmm. I see, boom, I'm like, okay, I like that. Now I want to see how do I feel? Can you create a space and a place to where I could be vulnerable and I could be my authentic self and you accept me for who I am? That's when the feelings come. Yes, right. but that's like co-created. That. It's not on her to create that. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. co-created. Totally agree. But I also will say that I think the world has standards of beauty. So I think it would be helpful uh, for you to even share what do you consider beautiful, right? Because I think that I think someone black that is just beautiful. But that's what I'm saying is like there's not the you know because you're a size four you're beautiful or because no you're shaped this you only only if you're an hourglass you're beautiful or only if you have clear skin you're beautiful right like uh-huh. i think we need to expand that because i think beauty has a lot to do with the personality of the person the the beauty of the person inside not just on the physical and i think there is so much overemphasis on that especially nowadays with all of these surgeries being very normalized. And I'm like, listen, do you, right, in any way that you want to do. Yeah, yeah. But I think there is a lot of pressure on women. And especially when it comes to finances, one of the things that aggravates me is I hear people say, never go into debt, save all your money, be <laughs> responsible, That's but me. make sure you look hot. And I'm like, hot ain't free. Fly ain't free, okay? You, so you makeup saying, costs, finance it? Makeup costs money. Finance it? Cute dresses cost money. Finance nice it? Nice bras and undergarments cost money. Heels cost money. But no, Rachel, I'm not saying Rachel, finance it, but I'm saying you can still be debt free and still be bad. Well, come on now, Rach. It's I'm saying it's possible, <laughs> but there are expectations that I feel that men have, and it's like save all your money, but also be fly. And it's like a world where women don't get to win, right? It's like either I'm irresponsible because I spent my money on being fly, or I'm so responsible, but now I'm not cute. So now you don't want to go out on a date with me, right? But we could flip that to the man too, though. Because okay. I mean, my story is the same way, and I totally understand what you're saying, right? I, but I think that's why we have to really start, which I love your your passion. We have to eliminate outside influences within our world. Mm-hmm. The reason why I got in $35,000 that $35,000 worth of debt was to impress a woman. Mm-hmm. Yes. Because women will say, hey, it ain't about your looks. You can be ugly, but if you come to the table with six figures, seven figures, <laughs> you, you, you fine as hell to me. That, that's what ladies are saying in, in today's day and time. I really you hope. You can be unattractive. I want everybody to understand that, listen, no matter how fly this chick is that you like, right, this woman is that you like, no matter how much money this man that you Talk like to. has, mm-hmm. both of those things can absolutely go away once you've made a commitment. Absolutely. So you need to be committed beyond the dollars absolutely. and beyond the beauty, right? Absolutely. And there has to be something else there, and hopefully Oof. it's substantive because those are the things that last for decades. Oof. Right. Like, the dollars may not last. You Talk. might have a broke period, okay? Ooh. Like, that's just what it is. That's what, see, see, wait, you talking my language. Talking my language. <laughs> so you better, like, you ho- better hope you like this person without the money. Yeah, yeah. That you like this person without all of the beauty because yeah. that will be part of the journey without question. Absolutely. Um, I want to talk about your story real quick because we don't have that much time left. We got like nine minutes left. Oh, my God. Um, we I have know. so much you more just, to say. Oh, I know. <laughs> uh, just one over here. How, how did you generate wealth? How did I generate yeah, wealth? So I, I, and what I really want to do is like someone who's watching this show and saying, yes. okay, I'm a sister um, and I want to say hello to seven. Yes. I want to say hello to seven figures. 
let's get them three practical things. What are three practical things they should be doing now to yes. start the process of saying hello? Okay, great. Step one, let's take some assessments okay. and acknowledge what are what are your natural skills and talents? And if you don't know what those are, you want to think about what did people compliment you on as a child, okay. right? Or what are some of the things that stood out to you? As a child, I used to always get in trouble for talking too much and I get paid to talk, right? Mm -hmm. So like, what were those things as a kid that you always had that natural ability? And then taking some assessments like Strengths Finders, DISC is another one, mm -hmm. Colby is another one. These are just different professional assessments that help you to understand how you work and like how you like to show up, what okay. your natural talents are. So like mine are influencer, right? Yep. So you can tell I'm a loud mouth, right? Uh, <laughs> Communication. Yeah. That's me. Um, yes, and, and leadership, right? Yeah. Like that, those are, and I also have like some in strategic. So it's like, that, that's my combo of things and that's literally what I do. Okay. So I believe that we are more likely to make a lot more money, a million or more, doing something that we can actually commit to long-term. Yes. And I believe that we're only gonna commit long-term to things that we actually can enjoy doing on a daily basis. Yes. So that's what I encourage people to do is do that assessment first, know yourself, and start to think about what are those dreams that you have, those ideas that you had that keep nagging you? What are those skills that you have that you can take and start to monetize? Because we all have them. We are all born with talent yeah. and, and abilities that we don't have. Like my assistant is especially talented in organization and yeah you know, predicting what's gonna go wrong before it goes wrong and planning around it. I'm terrible at that, right? Which is yeah. why I need her, Solid. right? <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's like we all have skills to bring mm -hmm. to the table and how can you use those skills to make money? I mean, that's all we're doing in the world every day, whether we have jobs or we're entrepreneurs, we're using our skills to make money. So good. So how can we make sure that we're using skills? Like I used to be somebody's assistant. I was the worst assistant in the world. That's the wrong job for me. Right. Even when we hire at my company, I have these assessments done for every team member because I want to make sure they're in a job that they actually love mm. and enjoy showing up every day. I don't want you doing something that you hate all day long mm. when you work for me. So that's step one is okay. figure out who you are, what you get excited about. And when you do that, then start thinking about, okay, so what, what offer could I put together given my skills? So okay. step two would be, let's put together an offer. Okay. And my recommendation in most cases, not all, is start with a service, something that you can sell, like a skill, something you could show up and do and sell and deliver, right? Okay. Is this like one-on-one? -on -one? Are we talking about a course? What if this person doesn't have a following like yourself? Yes. No, you could get that later, yes. right? But you need to have an offer. Okay. You can't make money if you don't got nothing to sell. True. Right? True. So True. have something to sell, then we'll figure out how to sell it, right? We could talk about that next. But the next step is figuring out what that offer is that you can that can fit into your life right now. Like if you have a full time job, great. What's an offer that you could do in the evenings or on the weekends, right? Yeah. That's manageable with whatever other responsibilities you have. Yeah. Cutting out the the nonsense, yeah. right? Yeah. Taking back your time. But then based on that, what can you deliver that's like a side business that would make you some money on the side? And you start revving that up slowly while you wind down the other things. No, so so and, and the reason why I say service businesses is because products often take R&D or manufacturing upfront capital, right? And so for some of us, if you have savings and you want to invest in building inventory, I would say pre-sell it first, always pre-sell. Okay. So we could talk about that as step three. Okay. But I think with products, like, a lot of product-based businesses started as services, right? Like mm. the Franklin Covey planners, they started out as consultants that taught people how to plan. Mm -hmm. Then they created a planner and that became the empire, right? Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of stories like that. So start the service business so that can fund the creation of the products. So good, I like So that. do that first. And then step three is pre-sell it, right? And so it's really simple and it takes some courage, but going to your audience and to your community and the people who already know you, I literally, when I launched my law practice, made a list of 100 people, law school classmates, professors, friends, my my auntie's friends from church, like my, you know, my cousins, I mean, all the people, right? I made a list of 100 people and I emailed all of them and then I sent them all a postcard and it said, I'm starting my law practice, here's what I can do. If you need my services, please hire me. If you know someone who can, you know, use my services, please share it with them. Yeah, yeah. And from that, got my first three clients and then those three clients referred other people, got more clients, and that's how the party started. Wow. So just announcing it to the people you know, using the network. We don't ask for help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're like, no, 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 I got it. Let me tell the internet and everybody in the world, right, right. but not ask somebody who knows me right. and can vouch for me. That all makes sense. Makes zero sense. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, but I think we're scared. We're scared to like claim that identity for ourselves. I'm an entrepreneur. This is my business. I'm starting. Yeah, yeah. It takes a while to like build up that courage, but I'm I'm like, listen. If you want to make the money, you got to make that announcement and put it out there. And you might have some people who try to discourage you, but you're also going to have people who are excited for you, who cheer for you, who will introduce you to somebody who will pay you money. Now you're talking good, Rachel, because um, a lot of people disagree with the network marketing space. It's a very unpopular uh, business, but mm -hmm. it's not an illegal business, right? So I hate it when people kind of attack that place. Like, oh, it's illegal. No, it's not. If it was illegal, we wouldn't be having the Mary Kays, the Avon, and stuff like that. It, is it unpopular? I, I get it. But I did network marketing for two years, and I would definitely say one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because they trained me on that. They, I had to take, take an assessment. They taught me how to put together the offer of my product. Mm. Then the very first thing they said, hey, open up your phone. Yep. And I, I was like, well, I open up my phone. It's like, that's your warm market. Yes. Don't go out here to the cold market. Don't go out here and and, and drop this. This is when prepaid legal was up. So we had to hand out tapes. Yes. Like literally the tapes that will just die on us. <laughs> and so it was like, you don't want to hand a stranger the tape without building your confidence first. Yes. So once you put together your offer, and I practiced my offer, I practiced like my elevator pitch. All right, so I had, you know, probably like 200 people on my phone. I called my mom and my daddy, my aunts, my uncles, my dogs, the cats, everybody. Had a meeting at my house, and I think I was like 20 of them. 20 of them uh, showed up. 11 of them purchased prepaid legal from me. Mm. And the other said, hey, we're just not really interested, but hey, keep winning. Yes. That gave me confidence yes. to now go to the cold market mm -hmm. and now get the a lot of no's to get that one or two, three maybe yeses, but then get 100 no's. But at least I knew what I was offering made sense. Yes. And exactly. so I like that. I really exactly. And, and people will support you. People who love you, who already mm. know you, mm. they will support you. And there might be some who don't. Yeah. And don't talk to them no more then. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. not that you have to stop being friends with them, but don't tell them your dreams if they're not worthy to hear them. Right? If they can't hold those dreams for you, cool, then don't. Don't go to somebody constantly who's going to, you know, make you feel bad about yourself. But you're going to find those people who are going to support you as well. And that's usually where the initial money comes from. That's good. You know, and I think in terms of no's, I think rejection is one of the best things. Like when I got my clerkship, I, I got I used to get letters every day for months at the end of law school where I was getting rejected by judges, by law firms, all these different places that I interviewed. Daily, I was collecting rejections. It was one of the best things that ever happened to me because you realize, oh, I didn't die. Yeah. You just said no. OK. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so like collect rejections. Look, go like make it your business to go get 100 no's because that means you out there doing it. Yeah. And you, that yes is coming. I love it. Uh, love teach me how to, I mean, love. <laughs> Knows teach me how to uh, honestly move forward even better. Exactly. Because um, so. then you find out why is it a no. Exactly. And then they tell you why, and then you build that into your offer. Let exactly. me solve that problem for you. Exactly. Now it's part of my offer. Come. Now you don't have that no no more. Ooh. But listen, man, we're going to be dropping Rachel's information in, in the show <laughs> notes. Y'all better get with her stuff because she's dropping this fire right now. <laughs> Hello seven, hello. What's good? You know what I'm saying? I'm about to remix her whole thing. Like, what's up, seven? What's good, son? You know what I'm saying? B? You know, my name is AO, son. What up, seven? Seven what? Seven fit no, seven figures. I want seven million. What's good, son? <laughs> All right, let me ask you this. We got two more questions. Um I wrote I wrote down a lot. We couldn't even get through all of them, but I want to respect your time and everyone else's time because I told my team. And our people now, we're going to hit them quickly with 30, 35 minutes. And we're yes. already over. But it's all good. This is some good stuff. <laughs> um, I think right now, right, everybody wants to make seven figures. Mm -hmm. Everyone says they're making seven figures. Mm -hmm. But studies are showing us that 64% in America, CNBC just came out with this probably at the beginning of last month, that 64% of people are living paycheck to paycheck. Yes. That Well, millionaires live paycheck to paycheck, too. Oh, trust me, I was just about to say that. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So that, like, when I hear people say I made a million dollars, I'm not really impressed. Yes. Because it's like, it's like, yeah, you made a million. Mm -hmm. um, how much did you spend on that on ads? Two, what's Word. your overhead? Three, what's your lifestyle? Correct. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, so you made a million, but really you're living just like you made maybe eighty thousand. Yes. And First of all, I, I, I don't know how you can watch that much money run through your company and not be mad that more of it is not kept. I'm like, no, 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 we need healthy profit margins. Absolutely. I so. mean, that's why we're in business. Yes. It's for the profit margin. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not really impressed by people who say the millions. Now, I know you run your game, that's why you're on my show, because you have a healthy profit margin. We can see with the hair, the dress, you know what I'm saying? We can see all of that, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> 
Well, we, we know Rachel got it, right? <laughs> but um, how long? It, how long? Let's say someone's starting today. Yes. And if they follow the, the Hello Seven principles. Yes. How long do you think it will take them to say hello to their first seven? Three years or less. Three years or less. Mm -hmm. I've had like I've that. had some people do. Well, they weren't starting from zero, but I I've had clients that were at like a hundred thousand and got to a million literally in six months they had a, a recurring run rate of wow. over a million and then when you say a million they made a million dollars in that six months they made a million dollars in one day well, let's say they're going from zero to three because i like to be realistic on my show like yeah like, 100 when i say a million dollars you make i mean million. cash collected don't talk to me about sales numbers where them dollars wow. are not in the door that's good because i that aggravates me or when yeah. people are like i just hit my first million but they mean like they've made a million over the last six years combined wow. and I'm like cool but let's be clear about what we're talking about right. when I say a million I mean one million dollars cash collected within 12 months within 12 months yes Come on, now that's what we talking yes that's what we talking. I, I don't uh, yeah no. all that fluffiness the and, math needs to math yeah, yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> I don't yeah, we can't uh -uh, I don't want to play those games right yeah, we can't have it and, and I'm not I, knocking people I mean you've made a seven if you made seven figures over six six years cool great right like nobody's mad at you but right. just don't make it I think we see a lot of people using magic marketing language yes to make it sound like it's more than it is yes and I I appreciate Appreciate realness. Just be yeah. honest with people about what is possible. Yeah. And a million dollars within 12 months is absolutely possible. And I think the average is based on the data from my own business and yeah. data that I've researched for my book. Yeah. I think three years is very reasonable. Yeah. Um, and it's like, and the reason why it takes three years is not because it takes three years to make that money. Right. You can make that money this year, literally. Right. You could start this year and make it in the next 12 months. Right. The reason why it takes three years is because mm. we have to mentally catch up. That's true. It's it's we are not taking on the identity of I'm an entrepreneur who runs a seven figure business. Cool. And that is why we don't act like a boss. We don't require cool. accountability of our employees. Um, we don't have standards in our business. We're not watching the profit mark. It's like all of these things have to be learned and we need time to learn the leadership yes. that is required to bu build that million dollar business. It's the mental game that takes you three years. Not It's not that in order to get that many clients it takes, no. For some people, I have seen people do it in less, yeah. right? And I have seen people of color, black women, do it in less. Wow. It's definitely possible, right. but it's just that if you haven't done the mental work yet, that's why it's going to take you some time, because getting up that courage and that confidence, shifting your identity from somebody who, you know, was a different person before. Now, now you're stepping into an identity where you're like, yo, I'm a boss. Being a boss means you get paid less. Being a boss means you deliver lots of bad news, right? Like, people don't talk about that part of being a boss, they right? Really it's don't. not just driving BMWs, yep. <laughs> okay? Yep. Yep, yep, <laughs> That's yep. what comes at the end after you don't had all those hard conversations and made those tough decisions. Yes. And put yourself out there when you're afraid. You, you're making art, right? Yeah. We're all sensitive about our art, yeah. right? And we put it out in the world, it gets rejected. And you can't go home and lick your wounds for the next three months and get so, your, you know, get your confidence back up. No, you got to get back out there yeah. and keep making those offers, right? Yeah. That's the stuff that really builds that, that toughness. It's the personal development that takes three years. Man, that is so true. I remember sitting down with my, uh, my friend and, and mentor, Pastor Darius Daniels, and um, he looked at me one day. He was like, hey, we're going to have a tough conversation. <laughs> and he said, you need to start thinking like an entrepreneur. Yes. He said, because you're scared to do this, and which, because you're scared to do this, you're scared to make money. Yep. When you're scared to make money, you're not going to have enough money to pay your team. Yep. Then he was like, hey, there are some things you need to put in place with your team. I know you're trying to be likable. I know yes. you're trying to be ha have your team like you, but no, you're called to be a steward of what God has given you, and you got to have these hard conversations. Yep. And you got to put these things into place, and there's a way you can do it that you come off as a boss, but you still come off respectful. Exactly. And 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 those are some hard conversations that I had to have. Like, yo, okay, yeah, you're AO, and, and your team loves you, but you're still the boss. Yes. And if they leave, then you're still the boss. Yes. It's still your company. Exactly. And you. And can't guess what? Down. Payroll got to be met every two weeks every two without weeks. fail. Not. Which me. means that I need you to hit those results that I'm asking yeah. you for that you're telling me you can deliver on. Yep. I need you to miss those, not miss those yeah. without fail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're directly connected. Absolutely. You have, show me an employee who is not delivering, and I will show you revenue that is dropping rapidly. Ooh 
mean? They are directly connected. I mean, well, yeah, you, if you let somebody deliver, sit yeah. on your payroll and not deliver, trust me, first of all, it's a disease and it will spread. quickly spread and Absolutely. infect the other people on the Absolutely. team. Yeah. And before you know it, your profit margins will be this, your revenue will start dropping, right? Yeah. Because that all affects the result for the client. Yeah. So having standards is an incredibly important part of be, being a business owner. And let me tell you something, that conversation, yeah. you're gonna have it again. Oh yeah. You're gonna hit eight figures and yeah. then you're gonna be like, oh, all of these standards and all of these systems that were acceptable at yeah. seven figures, that ain't it, that ain't <laughs> right? And then you gotta rebuild all Ooh. the foundation again for an eight figure business. Yep. And I imagine it will continue. It has to. You know, beyond yeah. that. I mean, so it's 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 evolving. Yes. You know but saying? that's why I love entrepreneurship because to me it's like I get to become my best self in this mm, journey. I'm good. forced to. Yep. In order to grow this business, in order to continue to serve, in order to continue to be on my assignment and accomplish my mission in life, I have to keep growing and stepping my game up. And mm. I can't be Rachel from last year. I have to be Rachel from five months from now. I gotta right. start growing into her now. Yes. Right? So that I can be the person that could be the steward of this. So organization good. right and this revenue so good and this team right like we we want our team to be worthy but we got to be worthy too Rachel do you teach the the process of building a healthy team inside of hello 7 absolutely you know, listen man we're gonna be dropping hello 7 um, in today's show notes um, because I think ladies y'all need to get in it brothers too if y'all want to be around a bunch of ladies yes um, just make sure you know what I'm saying you respect them Exactly. There's nothing like a good looking woman, black woman at that. And she making seven figures. Listen, first of all, you want to find a wife, you need to join the club, okay? <laughs> this club, not the not the nightclub, it's this club where your potential wife is at. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I would love that though. Yes. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't nothing like no finding your wife who's already saying hello to seven two. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> With your powers combined. Right? Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, honestly, that's where. Who do you think my coach is? My coach is my husband. He stayed like, let, let me see what I. Here's what I see you doing out on the field. Let's talk about it, right? It's like, I go out, do my thing. Yeah. He'll watch it. I'll come back and he'll be like, hey, here's what I saw. This. Here's where you held back. Yeah. Right? I think, but it, I think it does take a science. Not really a science. It takes a gift in both parties, especially the men the men, to be humble and to really desire partnership. Yes. Because I think sometimes when you have two alpha people, because I do believe that there are certain alpha ladies who, who can love, respect, still be submissive in their relationships, then there's alpha men who are just alpha, 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 alpha. And I think there has to be a level to where both of them are going after the same vision. And what I hear from you and your husband is like, yo, it's not me, let me run this, him, let me run that. It's like, hey, what's the vision for our family? Mm -hmm. How do we build and go towards that vision together? Exactly. It's an organization, right? Like, mm -hmm. he's the chief operator of this part, and yeah. I'm the, the chief operator of oh, this section part. over Ooh. here. We're doing the same thing in our in our family. Like, yeah. what are the... What are the skills that I have and what are the skills that he has? So and good. then we combine them and we own the things that are easiest for us to own. I don't try to make him do things that he don't want to do and vice versa. Yeah. And, it, and it is, I will say this, it's a mutual submission. That's so good. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it is a mutual submission. It's a mutual support. Sometimes he's going to do things he don't want to support me yep. and, and vice versa. Yep. Yep. And I think that that equity in the relationship is key because yep. otherwise somebody is going to be resentful eventually. Absolutely. No, no, no. That's so good. Submit one to another. I totally agree with that. I am i can't wait to submit to my wife. Let me, <laughs> what, what I got to do? <laughs> Don't you look good, girl. I do whatever you want me to do. Walk away. Walk away. My God. <laughs> Y'all, we are going to drop her book in today's show notes as well. We're going to drop her information, her website, and her social media uh, in today's show notes. Y'all, follow Rachel, man. We've been working on getting her on here for about two, three months. My schedule class the first time. Then yes. she couldn't get on here the second time. And, yo, we was like, yo, let's, let's get this nailed down. Um, this is a strong woman, strong woman of character and integrity. Love her spirit. She, she reminds me of me. It's like... <laughs> She could fire you and laugh right after she fire you. <laughs> she's always going to smile. She's always going to say whatever she needs to say with love and with just a smile. Um, and so definitely make sure y'all follow her. Follow her on Instagram. Uh, support her stuff. Uh, go check her stuff out. And uh, thank you so much for watching today's show. Um, love you. We'll see you on the next show. Peace out.